activity day one. So it's actually a, a fairly easy EVA day. NASA wants to give the astronauts a chance to get their bearings in Endeavour's cargo bay. But while the repairs may be simple, they aren't trivial. Crew members Story Musgrave and Jeff Hoffman will replace three faulty gyroscopes. And they're absolutely critical for the performance of the telescope in pointing to different parts of the sky. It's no good having a telescope going around the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour if you can't point it and direct it to the astronomical objects you want to. Hubble is equipped with six gyroscopes. If one more failed, it would lose its ability to point and track. Here's how the astronauts will fix this problem. Riding Endeavour's mechanical arm, Hoffman will use a power wrench to unscrew several bolts and doors at the base of the telescope. Musgrave will attach a foot restraint to the telescope and then remove bolts and connectors from the broken gyros. Then Hoffman will grab the replacements from a storage bin in the cargo bay and make the exchange with Musgrave. After the new gyros have been bolted in, the pair will install electronic control units and fuses for the gyros inside another equipment bay. And do you have uh, downlink now? Musgrave and Hoffman will also make preparations to replace Hubble's wobbly solar panels. Just how wobbly became apparent once the crew got a look at the telescope. There is a uh, definite kink. The kink in the stem holding one of the solar arrays may make it difficult for the crew to retract it so it can be stowed and returned to Earth. If the arrays are stuck open, they will have to be jettisoned. The uh, orbiter will maneuver such that there will be no chance of, of, uh, of recontact. NASA would prefer to bring the old solar arrays back home, but if they do indeed become space junk, it probably won't be long before they fall out of orbit, disintegrating on their way toward Earth. Miles O'Brien, CNN, Atlanta. This was the rehearsal, more than 300 miles above the Earth and traveling at 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet. An astronaut hauls himself along the open cargo bay of the shuttle Discovery. He's testing the equipment to be used this week when the crew of Endeavour attempt to capture and repair the Hubble Space Telescope. Each spacewalk is due to last six hours. Launched three years ago as a joint venture with the European Space Agency, the telescope cost one and a half billion pounds. Orbiting above the atmosphere, it was designed to see to the furthest reaches of the universe. But Hubble is short-sighted. There is a minute flaw in the 24-foot mirror at the heart of the telescope. Okie dokie, we can go up Mark and start thinking about the position to stick this puppy in. The astronauts are training for the near weightless conditions in a water tank at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Do you need me to scoot over there, KT? Um, stop for it. Uh, F. KT, Kathleen Turner, is clamped to the end of an arm. She's tugging on a box, which would be many times her own weight. And to Kathy, you're going to translate the HSP to the OR, to the affixture at the ORU carrier and temporarily stow the HST by engaging the one pit pin on the top fork. Now, this does not slide in sideways. This slides in from the top. Slides in from yeah. the top? Yes, ma'am. Once they've tethered Hubble to the shuttle's cargo bay, they'll remove an instrument called a photometer and replace it with a box containing five pairs of lenses, which will compensate for the distortion in the mirror. It's called CoStar. The astronauts will then install an updated version of the telescope's largest instrument, the Wide Field Planetary Camera. But the biggest task will be to replace the two solar arrays. Almost 40 feet long, they contain the solar cells which power the telescope. The sails made by British Aerospace expand and contract each time the telescope flies in and out of the sunlight because of the massive temperature changes. This is making the whole telescope judder. So British Aerospace has made new sails with extra heat shields. Together with other smaller repairs, the whole mission will cost 500 million pounds. Now NASA has to persuade its many critics that the shuttle can literally deliver the goods. The agency's future as well as the lives of the space engineers are at stake. Hello, I'm Miles O'Brien. A lot is riding on the current shuttle mission. How well the astronauts succeed in repairing the Hubble Space Telescope could have a major impact on support for big science projects like the telescope and for NASA itself.
It is a repair mission in more ways than one. Endeavour's astronauts hope a sharply focused Hubble will not only change its view of the universe, but also the way NASA is viewed at home. We think they're going to go up there and they're going to do something and it's not going to work. If they blow this one, they're in trouble. NASA's troubles did not begin or end when astronauts deployed the $1.5 billion Hubble Space Telescope with the infamous faulty mirror. Challenger, go at throttle up. Challenger, go at throttle up. The Challenger explosion, which killed seven astronauts four years before, the loss of the billion-dollar Mars Observer this summer, the faulty Galileo space probe, and persistent shuttle launch delays have all added to NASA's hard luck story and the perception this could be a do-or-die mission. I don't worry that the future of NASA is swinging on, on this mission. Um, I, I think about everybody on the team is, wants this mission to succeed. Uh, for the mission itself. And it is the most complicated, challenging space mission since NASA astronauts left footprints on the moon. A grueling five-day schedule of spacewalks will push the envelope of human capability in the weightless vacuum of space. Things will go wrong on the mission because that's the nature of the beast. There will be surprises. And so it will depend on how the astronauts and the ground controllers and so on manage to cope with the unforeseen problems that undoubtedly are going to crop up. Two Endeavour crew members have dramatically proven their mettle in unforeseen circumstances. In May of 92, Tom Akers and Catherine Thornton helped capture a wayward satellite after a grappling device failed to latch on. The ability of Endeavour's crew to deal with what NASA calls the unknown unknowns will help the agency answer some big questions. Can we design and operate spacecraft that can remain in orbit for a period of time and be serviced? Uh, they, you, could, you could take that uh, and as a parallel to uh, space station operations. Can you maintain and service uh, space station? A space station orbiting Earth is the cornerstone of NASA's future. A failed Hubble servicing mission would do little to keep that dream alive. To measure the future of NASA on this one mission, I would think is kind of unfair. It may be shaky and myopic, but the Hubble Space Telescope isn't blind. From its perch in space, it has watched the weather on Saturn and Jupiter and clearly seen Pluto's moon. It has found strong evidence of black holes and new clues to how stars, planets, and galaxies form. Most people still perceive this as a broken telescope. That's not a bad list for a broken telescope. Yet even its strongest supporters admit that's not nearly enough of a return on taxpayer investment. The goal is to go much further and answer some of the most fundamental questions ever posed. Like the, the origins of uh, the universe as we know it, the search for other planetary systems, the discovery of black holes in other galaxies, so many things which, uh, which somehow at a very deep level excite people's imagination. But three years after it was stationed in orbit, nearly 50 years after it was first conceived, public fascination with the $3 billion Hubble program seems a bit strained. There's a, of, there's a lot of people going, let's see, what did we pay this year in taxes? How much of that went to the Hubble? It doesn't work. It needs to do everything it's supposed to do. Hubble may come very close to finally meeting those expectations if Endeavour's risky repair mission comes off without a hitch. But for some, the verdict on Hubble and other government-funded projects of its ilk is already in. I cannot conceive that the American public will support uh, this kind of venture uh, any further. Scientist Rustam Roy helped lead the charge against another so-called big science project, the $11 billion superconducting super collider, which was killed by Congress in October. To suggest that our budget uh, capabilities would allow us to, to go forward without assistance and cooperation from the outside was probably a bit naive. In fact, future projects of Hubble proportions or beyond will likely be funded by more than one country. It's going to be representatives of planet Earth that will land on Mars, not representatives of the United States or Russia or France or China or Japan. For some American scientists, this change in philosophy may actually be good news because more resources might be available for smaller projects. So while the fundamental questions won't go away, where did the universe come from? Where is it going? What is my place in it? The prohibitive cost of searching for far-off answers may bring science closer to home.
I'm Sonia Rusler and here's a look at the hour's top stories. The repair of the Hubble Space Telescope is underway. Two astronauts moved into the US Space Shuttle Endeavour's cargo bay to begin work. They have replaced two pairs of gyroscopes and they plan to replace two electronic control units. The repair is hampered by the astronauts' bulky spacesuits and bubble helmets. We're watching live pictures now from Endeavour. You can see the astronauts. Jeff Ware, astronauts Story Musgrave and Jeff Hoffman are at work. Uh, heard, uh, what they're Tom trying Akers to do right now is to replace those electronic control units. If the gyroscopes are what point and track the telescope, the electronic control units are the brains. So let's listen now to NASA's mission control in Houston as they try to solve that. Out there, the view uh, without all of the glass of the shuttle windows in the way is just remarkable. Jeff Hoffman just uh, passed his uh, birthday wishes to wife Barbara. And with those birthday wishes live from the Space Shuttle Endeavour, we leave the live coverage. This is the first of five days of spacewalks, and CNN International will bring you live coverage throughout the mission. Spezialisten der NASA sind dabei, das defekte Weltraumteleskop Hubble zu reparieren. Was sich zur Stunde in der Ladebucht der Raumfähre Endeavour abspielt, ist bislang ohne Beispiel. Vermummt in ihre dicken und unbeweglichen Weltraumanzüge, mit Handschuhen, wie sie Skifahrer nicht einmal bei 20 Grad Minus tragen, versuchen die Astronauten das Unmögliche. Die Reparatur eines hochsensiblen, komplizierten technischen Geräts, dessen Defekte teilweise mit bloßem Auge gar nicht sichtbar sind. Und dabei geht es um viel mehr als nur um die Reparatur eines Fernrohres. Das Objekt der milliardenteuren Operation heißt Hubble. Eigentlich sollte es gestochen scharfe Bilder aus den Tiefen des Alls liefern, wie sie von der Erde aus bislang gar nicht vorstellbar waren. Doch einige Monate nach dem Start im April 1990 stellte sich heraus, Hubble funktioniert nicht wie erhofft. Hauptsorgenkind ist der 238 cm große Hauptspiegel des Teleskops. Ein Fehler im Schliff sorgte dafür, dass die Bilder von fernen Sternen und Galaxien nicht die erhoffte Schärfe aufwiesen. Jetzt sollen die Weltraummonteure drei kleine pfennig-große Hilfsspiegel montieren, die den Sehfehler des Teleskops ausgleichen sollen. Doch die schiefe Linse ist nicht der einzige Mangel des Geräts. Auch die aus Europa gelieferten Sonnenpaddel sorgen für Verdruss. Jedes Mal, wenn das Teleskop zwischen Tag und Nacht Seite der Erde wechselt, verziehen sich durch die Temperaturänderungen die Gestänge. Dann geht ein Zittern durch das ganze Raumfahrzeug und sorgt für verwackelte Bilder. Auch der Bordrechner hat sich zum Teil verabschiedet. Außerdem arbeitet er mit der Computertechnik der 80er Jahre. Er soll jetzt repariert und technisch nachgerüstet werden. Zu guter Letzt müssen auch noch einige Steuerungseinheiten des Teleskops ersetzt werden. Wie auch immer die Reparatur endet, sie wird ein Meilenstein in der Geschichte der Raumfahrt markieren. Gelingt sie, wird die Fachwelt von einem Wunder sprechen. Schlägt sie fehl, dürfte auch das Ende der NASA besiegelt sein. Amerikanische Politiker sind die Fehlschläge der letzten Jahre leid. Ein Scheitern der Hubble-Mission dürfte das Fass zum Überlaufen bringen. Als allererstes gestrichen werden dürfte dann die geplante Raumstation. Wenn es nicht einmal gelingt, ein Fernrohr zu reparieren, wie soll dann eine komplette Raumstation betriebsbereit gehalten werden, dürften sich die Kongressabgeordneten fragen. Ein Problem wird aber bestehen bleiben. Warum, so fragen sich alle an der Raumfahrt Interessierten, werden laufend Milliardensummen für Dinge ausgegeben, die es längst gibt. Während des Golfkrieges waren gleichzeitig fünf Weltraumteleskope aller Hubble auf einer Umlaufbahn im Weltall. Vier davon gehören dem US-Verteidigungsministerium und waren auf die Erde gerichtet. Sie lieferten gestochen scharfe Bilder vom Kriegsgebiet und sind vermutlich immer noch im Einsatz. Nur das fünfte Teleskop schielte ins Weltall, eben Hubble.
The repair of the Hubble Space Telescope is underway. Two astronauts are working in the cargo bay of the US Space Shuttle Endeavour. This is the first of five days of spacewalks. The task, the replacement of two pairs of gyroscopes and two electronic control units. The repairs are hampered by the astronauts' bulky spacesuits and bubble helmets. CNN International will bring you live coverage throughout the mission. We continue our coverage of the Space Shuttle Endeavour's repair mission on the uh, Hubble telescope. Our John Holloman is back with more. John, were they able to secure that door? Not yet, Kathleen. Uh, there's, a there's a problem out on the side of the telescope. Uh, the door that uh, contains the two gyroscopes is, um, is not completely latched. They've managed to close it. It has five latches. One of them is holding. The others are not yet. What uh, the astronauts are probably going to try to do next is to take a, a metal tether, a cable, and wrap it from one door handle to another and then pull on that and uh, force the door shut that way. If that works out, then they'll be able to get that door closed. It's not an emergency. They've got uh, five days in which to, to get the latch. You see astronaut Jeff Hoffman there on videotape working with the latch uh, a little bit earlier today, trying to get this thing uh, to go together. You can probably see there's a black line down the middle between the two doors. That's the gap they're trying to close. They've uh, had the telescope go into sunlight, hoping that heat might uh, close the gap. And the next thing they'll try, as I say, is this wrapping a cable around and forcing the two door sides together um, by putting pressure on two handles and then having the other astronaut who's not putting the pressure on the handles uh, try to get those latches fit together. But uh, that's what's going John, on right now. John, they're working under some very clumsy circumstances. These spacesuits are bulky and the uh, insulated gloves very thick. Mm -hmm. So I guess their range of motion is stymied somewhat. Yeah, one of the reasons that the tools they use are so huge is because their hands in these big uh, inflated gloves are, you know, can't really grab uh, very much more than that. And so that's, uh, that's slowing things down. But what's happening, Kathleen, they tell me, is that uh, this is not a very high stress, high exertion night of spacewalking. And because of that, the astronauts may get to stay outside in the cargo bay longer than the six hours that's on the schedule. If they want to do that, they'll be able to stay as much as seven, maybe seven and a half hours outdoors tonight. Since they started their spacewalk an hour and about 20 minutes ahead of schedule, that would put them back in sometime just after six o'clock Eastern time. They don't have to do that, and they could come in earlier if they finish all their work. But since they haven't done that yet, they're going to stay outside for a while longer. In the past few minutes, uh, while we were uh, taking a break to catch up on other news around the world, the astronauts were able to finish the second of the three major things they have to do in this particular first night of spacewalk. They were able to uh, replace electronic control units for the gyroscopes. So now the gyroscopes themselves have been replaced with gyroscopes that hopefully work. The electronic control units that provide power to the gyroscopes have also been replaced in the past uh, 25 or 30 minutes. And the last big job for today is to replace some fuses, fuses that haven't blown but are being upgraded with, uh, with better, higher capacity fuses inside one of the doors on the side of the telescope. At this moment, we're unable to get live picture um, down here on the ground from the telescope uh, because the um, tracking and data relay satellite, which is used to send those pictures, is out of range of the space shuttle at this moment. But probably in the next um, 10 or 15 minutes, we'll have more picture. As soon as we do that, we will bring it to you live, of course. John, what's on the agenda for tomorrow? What can we expect them to do on their next spacewalk? Tomorrow may be the most complicated day of this mission, Kathleen. Two astronauts, Kathy Thornton and Tom Akers, will go outside and they'll have to replace the solar panels that are on the side of the space telescope. Uh, those solar panels, as you know, have had problems since the beginning. Every time the telescope goes into sunlight out of darkness or darkness out of sunlight, the solar panels wiggle, and that causes the telescope itself to shake, making it much more difficult for it to take a good, clear picture. The new solar panels are supposed to be better than the old ones in that instead of having rigid bars along the sides of the panels, they have springs which will uh, perhaps damp this shaking when the, when the telescope hits sunlight or hits darkness at the, uh, you know, a couple of times each orbit. And um, they're hoping that they'll be able to uh, take the old solar panels that are out there now, roll them up so they can bring them back to Earth so that they don't have to leave them out in space, and then put the new ones on and come back. But one of the solar panels that's currently on the telescope is in bad shape. It is bent, it is warped, the control rod that uh, keeps it extended has a big kink in it, and it may well be that the astronauts are going to find it impossible to roll up that solar panel. And if they, if they can't roll it up, what they're going to have to do is leave it extended, uh, take it, disconnect it from the telescope, and push it off into space. 
which would be a waste of uh, lots of millions of dollars and uh, would create one more pretty huge piece of space junk to be floating mm -hmm. around. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. We'll, uh, we'd like to hear from your viewers. If you have questions about what's going on, we have a phone number we'd like you to call. And um, when we get back, we'll give you that. In fact, there it is now. The folks at NASA say that uh, CNN viewers are calling a lot of their centers. Instead of calling us, please don't call them. They're busy. They're doing a spacewalk. Call us. All we want to do is talk to you. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to our live coverage of the spacewalking mission of the Space Shuttle Endeavour. Joining us, a, a man who knows a lot about astronomy and a lot about the Space Telescope and a lot about Edwin Hubble, for whom it was named, Hal McAllister, an astronomer from Georgia State University. Hal, there are a lot of different instruments on board the telescope, and um, I'd like to ask you to make a, a uh, tell, just tell me the difference between two of the cameras. There's the wide field planetary camera, this big camera on the side of the Hubble, and then there's another one called the faint object camera. What's the difference between these two? I think the adjectives in the names pretty well describe the difference. The wide field planetary camera is designed to do high resolution imaging over a relatively wide field of view. Uh, take, it has taken these lovely pictures that we've seen of uh, Saturn, for example, seeing the beautiful structure of the rings on the surface. The faint object camera is the camera that is, has very high sensitivity and is designed to see the faint, most distant things in the universe that we can image. The trick there is, again, the, uh, the lack of space telescope's current ability to give very sharp images means that the faint object camera is not fulfilling its original specifications. And one of the things the astronauts are going to try to fix is the, uh, the uh, focusing mechanism for that faint object camera so those pictures will be better. That's correct. All right. We've got callers uh, waiting to talk to us. We urge you to call us. And please call us at CNN rather than NASA. They have called to let us know that uh, hundreds of our viewers are calling NASA centers instead of CNN center. We want you to call the number in the 404 area code to get through to us here. Our first caller is on the line from New York. Go ahead, please. Yes, I have uh, a few questions. One of my questions is what does the name Hubble, what, where does that come from, what does it mean? Second question is, um, how are we going to be able to see things using this telescope if the mirror is imperfect? And third question deals with a planet toid type thing that was found a couple of years back outside the solar system toward beyond Pluto. Um, how come we haven't heard anything about that and what type of information do we know about that? Okay, three good questions for an astronomer. Luckily, we have one of the top ones in the country seated about uh, 20 feet from where I am. Hal, go ahead. Well, let's, let's start with, with Edwin Hubble. Uh, Edwin Hubble was an astronomer who worked during the 1920s and 30s and, and in subsequent years at the Mount Wilson Observatory near Los Angeles, California. And it was Hubble who used the great 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson who discovered the expansion of the universe. And in many ways, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is coming along to finish up the job that he started 60 or 70 years ago. Um, we hope that it will live up to the name that um, it's carrying with it. The uh, third question about the planetoid, and you may need to remind me the second question, but the third question probably has to do with the fact that from time to time, objects are found far out in the solar system, and there is a great deal of initial interest in them. We've learned that there are uh, the, the minor planets between Mars and Jupiter. There are apparently families of these minor planets that exist further out into the solar system beyond the orbits of the Jovian planets. Uh, can you remind me of your second question? It was about the, the problem with the main mirror on Hubble, Hal, and I can, uh, I can grab that quickly, I think. Okay. Uh, when they were building the telescope initially, they, they used an instrument to uh, determine just how thick the, uh, the main 90-inch mirror inside the telescope should be at its outer edge, and the instrument uh, was improperly calibrated, so the mirror was off by the width of a 50th of a human hair. And what they've done is uh, spent millions of dollars coming up with a new set of corrective lenses that are going to go in um, right below where you see on the, your screen here the primary fine guidance mirror. That's where the instruments are. Actually, you can see at the bottom of your screen some of the scientific instruments. New instruments will go in there, which have new mirrors that are ground to uh, compensate for the problem with the main mirror, which is uh, up in the front of the telescope. So that's the, that's the answer to that question. We have more callers on the line now, I think. I've forgotten from which state, but um, Illinois. Go ahead, please. 
Hi, my name is uh, Tony Martin. I'm in Chicago, and uh, I'm a space nut from, from the first day I was born. I'd like to uh, comment about the 286 information that was uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. That surprised me. Uh, 286, I got a 286 sitting right here in front of me. Of course, my heart just has crashed. And that made me think of the Pioneer and Voyager uh, satellites, probes that we sent out. What technology did they use? Computers or, or whatever, tubes, transistors, integrated circuits? Uh, that's my uh, first question. And uh, CNN does a great job. And is there a NASA television cable channel that I can tune to or bulletin boards or someplace I can get uh, videotapes of NASA missions? Uh, can you help me there? Yep, absolutely, Tony. NASA does have a television service. It's called NASA Select. And uh, for the past several years, actually since the Challenger, it has been on television almost 24 hours a day with uh, programs about, uh, about the space program. Uh, however, recent budget cuts have convinced uh, NASA that they can't operate it 24 hours a day anymore. It's, uh, it's available on satellite dishes. I have a dish at home, and it's going to be operated only during shuttle missions, according to uh, officials at the space agency from now on. But the pictures that we see uh, here on CNN, we get uh, directly from NASA using that system. And uh, on the question of uh, the computer technology, uh, we were talking about uh, 286 versus 386 computer technology, which probably many of our viewers don't understand. A, a 386 computer works better than a 286 computer, and what they're replacing, what they'll be replacing in a couple of days on the Space Telescope is um, the, the current computer aboard with a higher powered computer. As to what sort of electronics they used on some of the earlier Voyager type space probes, it was the best electronics they could get at the time. It, I don't think it was any of it was tube type. It was all transistor, but it was early transistor technology, a lot of it, uh, which managed to work extraordinarily well. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back as our coverage from Endeavor continues. Welcome back. The two astronauts who were involved in their first spacewalk of at least five to be conducted this week are about two-thirds of the way done now. They've repaired and replaced two sets of gyroscopes aboard the Hubble Space Telescope and the electronic control units that will run those gyroscopes from now on. And um, the next thing for the astronauts to do is to replace a series of eight fuses, very similar to old-timey cartridge fuses in your fuse box. When that's done, they will have completed uh, virtually everything they have to do today in order to, um, to get the first day of the spacewalk all out of the way. Things are going pretty well. There's one problem in that the uh, main door over the shuttle's gyroscopes won't close completely. It has several latches on it. Only one of those latches has, uh, has seated so far. You see there astronaut Jeff Hoffman working with one of the latches that wouldn't close properly. Uh, the uh, managers on the ground say they're not too worried about it. They assume it'll get fixed uh, sometime in the next three or four days. We're uh, asking you if you have questions or you want to talk about what's going on in space now to give us a call. We have a caller on the line now from Washington. Go ahead. Good morning. Well, I don't hear from our caller. Well, this is from Chicago. Okay. I'll take a caller from Chicago. Certainly. Go ahead. Well, this, uh, we had to go to commercial break. I wanted to, the NASA address for the videotapes and donations, you know, um, clubs and computer bulletin boards. Is there a computer bulletin board available? I'm not sure. I think NASA does have a computer bulletin board. I don't have the, the right answer to tell you how to get in touch with that bulletin board. But um, if you'll call me when we get off the air, there's a main number for CNN. I'll try to find out and I'll let you know about it. Okay, now we have a caller from Washington State. Go ahead, please. Yes, this is uh, Doug from Seattle. Hi, Doug. And um, I want to tell you that you and Dr. McAllister are doing a really good job. And I have two questions for you. The first one would be, uh, I've always wondered this about weightlessness in space. What is the relationship to, say, a 200-pound man as opposed to a 2,000-pound uh, object when he has to work with it? The relationship and the difference as opposed to what it would be like on Earth. And my second question would be, we've always heard about seeing to the edge of the foreseeable um, end of the universe. Um, as we could see it, and for Dr. McAllister, could he comment? I heard one theory that you could uh, basically start out in the spaceship and you'd end up where you started eventually, 
And my question to you would be, I've always been curious, I know as far as we could see would be the edge of the universe, but what is past that? I know we don't know, but would you think it would just be space, or could you even comment on that? All right, let me go first about uh, what big heavy things on Earth are like to operate in weightlessness. I've never been weightless, I've always wanted to be, but um, the astronauts say that once you push something in weightlessness that is large, it uh, has a tendency to continue to go, and it's difficult to stop things once you start them moving. And um, the way that translates into what we'll be seeing tomorrow night and the, the following nights of these spacewalks is that the astronauts will be moving objects like the huge wide field planetary camera, which you see there under the word from on your TV screen right now. The big white box is the outer edge of the wide field planetary camera. It's the size of a grand piano. And when it comes out of that slot, uh, not tomorrow night, but the night after that, um, the astronauts will be very, very cautious in how they handle it because it is uh, so, it has so much mass. It, it won't have any weight in the, in the uh, microgravity of space, but it'll be very interesting to watch them. Hal, take the other half. The, the question about the edge of the universe is, uh, uh, is a rather difficult one, to, I think, to fully understand. But let me, let me try to explain it from the point of view of, of the finite speed of light. Light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. That means that if the universe is, say, oh, let's just say 10 billion years old, a question we hope to answer in the next decade or so, that means that we can only see out as far into the universe as light has had time to travel from some portion in the universe. So we actually have a, a kind of horizon to the universe beyond which we cannot yet see because the universe simply isn't old enough to let light travel from distances beyond that horizon. Hal, we're going to have to take a break now. We'll be right back, and you can continue that answer, and we'll have more live pictures from Endeavor as CNN's coverage continues. Stay with us. The first repair of the Hubble Space Telescope has been successfully completed. Two astronauts have been working in the cargo bay of the U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavour in the first of five days of spacewalks. They have replaced two pairs of gyroscopes, and we hear that one of them has already re-entered the Space Shuttle, and the other one is outside looking in. We can see these live pictures now from the Space Shuttle Endeavour. CNN International will bring you live coverage throughout the mission. This was the first of five planned spacewalks. Un filin, le cordon ombilical de l'espace. Pour travailler, un astronaute était installé sur une plateforme à l'extrémité du bras robot commandé par Claude Nicolier. Son coéquipier, lui, l'aidait en transportant les pièces et outils nécessaires. Les deux hommes ont remplacé une paire de gyroscopes, installé de nouveaux boîtiers électriques et changé huit fusibles. Le seul problème est venu d'une porte latérale du télescope. Impossible de la refermer. Les ingénieurs au sol planchent maintenant pour remédier à cet imprévu. Die Bucht der Raumfähre Endeavour mit der Reparatur des kurzsichtigen Weltraumteleskops Hubble begonnen. Einige Geräte wurden bereits in Ordnung gebracht bzw. ausgetauscht. Der erste von insgesamt fünf geplanten Außenaufenthalten verlief nicht ohne Schwierigkeiten, aber bis jetzt doch recht erfolgreich. Ein Astronaut schwebt frei im All, ein zweiter steht auf einer Plattform am Ende des Robotergreifarms der Endeavour. Kreiselmessgeräte, die zum Ansteuern der Beobachtungsziele dienen, wurden ausgetauscht. Die Astronauten berichteten wörtlich, dass der Einsatz kraftraubend und sehr schweißtreibend gewesen sei. As astronauts worked for more than seven hours in the cargo bay of the U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavour in the first of five days of spacewalks. They have replaced two pairs of gyroscopes. Both astronauts have now re-entered the shuttle. CNN International will bring you live coverage throughout the mission. Another four spacewalks are planned. It was a successful night's work on board the Space Shuttle Endeavour. Two spacewalking astronauts made the first repairs on the Hubble Space Telescope. They're trying to correct Hubble's blurry vision. The astronauts replaced faulty parts and even managed to latch a misaligned access door. Another late night spacewalk to replace Hubble's shaky solar panels is set for Monday. Those are the headlines. We'll have more in an hour. I'm Lyndon Soles. We now return you to the CNN World Report. Astronauten Hoffman und Musgrave hatten heute beim ersten von fünf geplanten Weltraumspaziergängen alle Hände voll zu tun. In der offenen Ladebucht der Raumfähre Endeavour mussten sie Überstunden machen, weil zwei Teleskopluken klemmten. Nach fast acht Stunden schweißtreibender Arbeit in den klobigen Raumanzügen 
hatten sie dann die ersten kniffligen Reparaturarbeiten am Weltraumteleskop Hubble erfolgreich ausgeführt. Insgesamt sollen elf Teile an dem defekten Riesenfernrohr ausgewechselt werden. Die beiden amerikanischen Astronauten Story Musgrave und Jeff Hoffman schwebten um 4.14 Uhr mitteleuropäischer Zeit in den offenen Laderaum der Raumfähre Endeavour. Ihr erster Job, zwei Kreisel auszuwechseln, mit denen das Fernrohr auf seine Ziele im All ausgerichtet wird. Wie es im Kontrollzentrum in Houston, Texas hieß, gelang, gelang die Operation trotz einiger Probleme. Voraussichtlich werden Musgrave und Hoffmann fast sechs Stunden im All bleiben. In den nächsten Tagen sind vier weitere Reparaturgänge in der Schwerelosigkeit geplant. Astronauten der US-Raumfähre Endeavour haben damit begonnen, das kurzsichtige Weltraumteleskop Hubble zu reparieren. Hubble hängt am Roboterarm der Raumfähre und zwei Astronauten versuchen dem Teleskop eine Art Kontaktlinse einzubauen. Dabei gab es erste Komplikationen, weil sich eine Tür des Weltraumteleskops nicht schließen ließ. Sollte die Reparatur gelingen, würde Hubble 87 Prozent der ursprünglich geplanten Sehschärfe erreichen. Der erste Arbeitsgang im All soll sechs Stunden dauern. Pairs on the Hubble telescope. This morning they took the first of several spacewalks needed to replace faulty electrical equipment. It took much longer than expected because of a door that would not close. The telescope has been transmitting faulty images since its launch in 1990. After the astronauts had replaced two pairs of gyroscopes needed to point Hubble, they could not get a door to the gyro compartment closed. They backed off, experts on the ground thought about it, and success. I think we got the door closed. Good work, guys. Hubble was launched in 1990 with his mirror made incorrectly. But if the remaining repair walks go as well as the first, the huge telescope should be able to see the most distant stars. Jay Barbary, NBC News at the Johnson Space Center, Houston. Déjà, l'électronique de bord des chocs thermiques. Pendant que Jeffrey Hoffman, les pieds attachés à l'extrémité du bras robot, manipulé par le Suisse Claude Nicolier, dévisse une à une, les attaches du gyroscope à changer, Story Musgrave, faufilé à l'intérieur du télescope spatial, procède au changement des pièces effectueuses, des deux unités de contrôle et des huit fusibles de Hubble. Seul petit problème au cours de cette première sortie, pratiquement réussie à 100%, il a été impossible à Jeffrey Hoffman de refermer la trappe du télescope ouverte pour accéder au gyroscope. Un problème de dilatation des métaux. En effet, à chaque tour de terre, il fait jour pendant 60 minutes dans la soupe de la navette avec des températures dépassant les 100 degrés et nuit pendant 40 minutes avec moins 100 degrés. Cela explique les contraintes thermiques rencontrées, mais rien de bien grave selon le centre de contrôle de Houston. Au programme de demain, le changement des deux immenses panneaux solaires endommagés de Hubble avec en prévision d'autres images époustouflantes. Die Piloten der amerikanischen Raumfähre Endeavour haben heute mit der Reparatur des Weltraumteleskops Hubble begonnen. Bei diesem ersten von fünf geplanten Weltraumausflügen hatten die Astronauten unerwartete Probleme. Im All klemmten die Türen. Letzte Stärkung vor dem langen Arbeitstag im All. Dann verlassen die US-Astronauten Hoffman und Madgrave die Raumfähre. Sie wissen noch nicht, dass die geplanten Reparaturarbeiten nicht die einzigen kniffligen Aufgaben für heute bleiben. In der offenen Ladebucht der Endeavour müssen sie Überstunden machen, weil sich zwei Teleskopluken nicht mehr richtig schließen lassen. Nach fast acht Stunden schweißtreibender Arbeit in den klobigen Raumanzügen ist das Problem dann gelöst. Insgesamt sollen bei mindestens fünf Weltraumspaziergängen elf Teile an dem Riesenfernrohr ausgewechselt werden. Das Weltraumteleskop Hubble ist seit vier Jahren defekt. The Endeavour astronauts started their spacewalk more than an hour ahead of schedule. Jeff Hoffman and Story Musgrave were raring to go. They quickly got ahead of schedule in opening the two huge doors on the side of the space telescope, replacing two gyroscope steering units inside, but then trouble. They couldn't close the doors. Okay, copy that. Sounds like uh, you're going to need a battery huh? Delay in sealing the door put the crew behind schedule for the first time, but Hoffman and Musgrave, balancing together on the robot arm, 
were able to replace the electronic control boxes for the gyroscopes and replace some fuses stored inside one of the telescope doors. Story Musgrave was able to help the next team of spacewalkers by preparing the replacement solar panels for their installation before sunrise on Monday. The NASA equivalent of a tie-down belt was finally used to force those doors on the telescope together so the latches could be closed. Guys. After the astronauts had spent more than seven hours out in the payload bay, they cleaned up their workspace and went back inside to rest. Ground controllers ordered the telescope solar panels to roll up in preparation for the next spacewalk. Astronauts Kathy Thornton and Tom Akers will replace the solar panels before dawn on Monday. John Holloman, CNN reporting. Deva ist die erste von fünf Reparaturen am milliardenteuren Hubble-Teleskop geglückt. Die Weltraummission gilt als die schwerste seit der Mondlandung. Die Astronauten sollen dem riesen Fernrohr Kontaktlinsen installieren, damit das kurzsichtige Teleskop endlich scharfe Bilder vom Universum liefert. Nach acht Stunden schweißtreibender Arbeit in den klobigen Raumanzügen hatten die beiden mit langen Seilen gesicherten Endeavour-Astronauten Musgrave und Hoffmann die erste knifflige Reparatur erledigt. Sie tauschten defekte Geräte aus, die die Achsendrehung der Erde messen. Viel Nerven und Arbeitszeit kostete es das Reparaturteam, die fünf Verschlusssysteme an der klemmenden Doppeltür des Hubble wieder in Ordnung zu bringen. Deshalb mussten sie mehr als zwei Überstunden außerhalb der Raumfähre einlegen. Auch an Bord waren die Astronauten nicht faul. Der Schweizer Nicolier machte den 15 Meter langen Roboterarm der Endeavour zur Verlängerung seines Arms. An der Spitze des Greifarms saß sein Kollege Hoffmann und führte in 590 Kilometer Höhe die Reparaturen aus. Und nach getaner Teamarbeit gab es erst einmal eine kleine Stärkung. Overnight, two spacewalking astronauts made the first repairs on the Hubble Space Telescope. They're trying to correct Hubble's blurry vision. The astronauts replace faulty parts and even manage to latch a misaligned access door. On Monday, they will try to repair and replace solar panels on the telescope. And that's world news for now. Treibende Angelegenheit. Fast acht Stunden dauert dann der erste von fünf geplanten Reparatureinsätzen am defekten Weltraumteleskop. Jeder Handgriff tausendmal geübt, die Bodenstation 600 Kilometer tiefer ist zufrieden. Die Bilanz des ersten Tages, mehrere elektronische Messgeräte und Kontrolleinheiten sind erneuert, acht Sicherungen ausgetauscht. Die schwierigsten Operationen, das Auswechseln der Sonnensegel und der Einbau der riesigen Kontaktlinse können beginnen. This is Mission Control Houston. We're now receiving live television from Endeavour's lower deck as mission specialist Jeff Hoffman and Story Musgrave go through the first steps of getting ready for their spacewalk. And we're looking at Story's handsome mug right now. Hello, Jeff. Jeff, you're going to have your hands full. You might want to 
want to go ahead and set your helmet lights on. Could I do? Endeavor Houston for Tom. Go ahead. The RSUs have been powered off. They will complete their spin down at 1926.33. Reminder, you've got a yaw maneuver coming up at 1930 uh, to keep an eye on the doors. Okay, copy, we will, thanks. <laughs>
Captain Denver Houston. Go ahead. Not to get you spun up, but we have six good gyros on the telescope. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good work, guys. And we got your downlink video, Jeff. <laughs> 